Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. And I'm William McGriffey. And welcome to Vlog 64, Authorship and the PhD. And I'm with my great friend Gwilym here at the University of Bangor in glorious Bangor, Wales. Now, Gwilym and I met each other a year ago online. No, not on Tinder. <laughs> uh, but he and I met through a wonderful series of conversations we had via email about the issue and the problem of authorship in the PhD space. So I've come all this way to see Gwilym and talk about authorship, but he came and visited us at Flinders University in Adelaide. So it seemed right to repay that favour. And he's a dear friend, a great human being. And hi, Gwilym. Hey, yes, I how you gotten? Very well. <laughs> this is brilliant, but I'm just so happy to have you on the blog, and I always promised you we'd talk about this, because there is no doubt that the issue of authorship and the ownership of ideas is a really, really big concern in doctoral education, and most of the complaints and the issues I hear about Gwilym around the world, most of them are about authorship and the PhD. So, shall I tell people a little bit about you? Sure. So, a Bachelor of Theology from Aberystwyth, correct? Yeah. Postgraduate certificate in education from the University of South Wales. Mm -hmm. This is brilliant. MA in social research and social policy from Bangor and is currently enrolled in a PhD. <laughs> and let's start off with that. Tell everybody, if you can, about the PhD because it's personally resonant for you, but also professionally and politically quite significant too. So tell people about your PhD. Yeah, my PhD is um, about stroke care and languages uh, in, in Welsh from three perspectives, from the stakeholders, the patient and the, um, and the practitioner, basically. And it's looking at um, why Welsh is important in health and social care. Uh, most people in, in Wales, they speak English, can, can speak English um, if they're Welsh, but it, um, it can have um, an adverse effect if, you're, um, if you can't express your um, problems through the medium Welsh uh, in A&E. So it right. can lead to uh, misdiagnosis and it actually can cost the NHS a um, bit more basically. So that's really powerful, so that's someone who has had a stroke and what happens linguistically to them and the particular concerns for a bilingual population. Yeah. That's a really significant and powerful PhD. The next question I was going to ask you, though, is where our relationship started, really, and that is about authorship in a PhD program. So, Gwil, mate, what, you know, why did you originally contact me a year ago, and why we became mates, and why is that an issue that I think is becoming increasingly resonant in the doctoral space, mate? Yeah, well, I contacted you well, originally because um, I had no faith in the um, in the institution I was uh, serving at the moment. Um, it definitely is uh, important academic authorship. Um, it's important to academics to communicate the results um, of, of their scholarly work, and um, primarily for two reasons really: to share um, with, the, with the planets the discoveries that they have in both pragmatic and. Um, and theoretical terms, yes. but it's also about building personal relationships as well, and <laughs> like we have, like we have, and it's also the mode which is often based um, using uh, you, know, you know universities for employment and uh, tenders basically and um, promotions, and so it's it's really important. It, it, it is, and is your perspective on that, mate, that the PhD student is not in an empowered space when we're talking about authorship? Yes, definitely disempowered. So they're disempowered. So how we organise and make sure there is an authorship policy so the students are protected, yeah. I think is quite an issue. You've seen a lot of problems in that space, and so have I. Okay. Yeah, I think there's, there's two different stuff. There's academic kind of malpractice, isn't there, yeah. which is you know, treated by the institution, but there are international strategies as well and um, bodies who can protect authorship in different ways. But I don't think both of them talk to each other. Um, and I think there's an increased trend, really, of people kind of borrowing work. Wow. To say and I think you're clever on that, as you, you're a brilliant, brilliant man. But I think you are right. There's a slippage with, between the policies of research integrity and academic integrity, all the obfuscation around self plagiarism, for example. And we may be missing the main game of how empowered academics are deploying the data sets and. and perhaps adding their name to publications where they perhaps have not done enough work on that publication. So 
The other question, because you are enrolled in a PhD and all the wonderful PhD students at Flinders are looking at you, <coughs> so from your perspective and experience, Gwilym May, what is causing delays in PhDs that you're seeing either in your own life but also in Wales and the UK, do you think? Um, from, my, from my own personal perspective, it's because, you know, I, I suffered strokes uh, myself, yeah. so that's why I got sort of resonance with PhD. Uh, but with the, you know, I didn't have the headspace or, or the health to actually carry on at, the, at the time. I should have been honest with myself, right. and, uh, you know, and, and kind of not push myself really. But w one of the major barriers um, I feel that can um, delay you is supervisory issues. And I've had a few, I've had, a, you know, I think eight in all by now. Eight supervisors? Yeah. So, so obviously you're not taking that personally. Well, I take some of it personally. You take some of it personally. Yeah. So, so uh, <laughs> I didn't know there were eight. I didn't know we got up to eight. Wow, that's really that's really impressive. Are you going for a record there, mate? Or are you? I'm not sure. You can tell me. <laughs> so, so changing supervision is a great characteristic of a delay in a PhD. And also, as you rightly said, it's people perhaps have had an issue happen in their life, personally, professionally, and perhaps not logging it, mate, and going. Oh right, that's an issue. I, I need to do some self care. Mm -hmm. So you just push on and go. It's going to be okay. And sometimes it's not. No, that's right. Yeah, definitely. That's my personal perspective. For uh, and I think you were also eight eight supervisors. Yeah, some were, some were. Yeah, <laughs> not engaging. Others were disengaging. I was disengaging with others. And I think that report is really important, really, to get the the work in and have you know have a good understanding, basically, in the supervisor. It's, it's got to be a good relationship. You've picked up all the problems that cause delay, with really. poor supervisory relationships, issues with academic and research integrity, and also personal self-care. I think this is really powerful. This next question is very interesting to me, and I'll tell you why I've put this in. Once you've given me your answer, I don't know what you're going to say, but we are obviously recording this vlog at the beautiful University of Bangor. Wow, the buildings are just beautiful. This is a beautiful place. Come and see Bangor. But your thesis is being written in Welsh, and much to my shame and horror, I don't speak Welsh, but your oral exam will be conducted in Welsh. So. so tell me a little bit about the importance of writing PhDs in a language like Welsh, and the importance of a bilingual workforce and the importance of committing to the language at doctoral level. Yeah, well, for me, um, language is your identity. You think in a different language, you construct in a different language, um, but the political value of that as well it, it goes beyond on the academic to forest. Um, so yeah, my thesis will be in Welsh and uh, it resonates with the experiences of Welsh speakers being bilingual as I am, as the researcher doing the the research and if it's done well I'm sure it'll have generalizability for other kind of worldwide um, minority language groups which Welsh is, it's protected by European law um, and so yes I'm hoping it has value in those, those contexts but in the workforce value of course um, and especially going back to the PhD if, um, if nurses and practitioners and lecturers are, are taught about the importance of bilingualism or you know every other language or you know, um, existing co co coexisting together. Um, I, I think those are very important for lectures to give to practitioners who will be practicing uh, their their their, their um, th theory basically on the wards, and it'll ultimately benefit patient and it'll probably help with uh, misdiagnosis and um, prognosis basically. See, this is fantastic for me, and the reason I asked you that is I have a commitment to all sorts of different languages, and we have a problem in Australia at the moment, and that's particularly with regard to Indigenous enrolment right. in PhD programs. And there are many, there's multi-phasic reasons where Australian higher education institutions are failing our Indigenous students, and we haven't decolonised enough, it's not the students, it's us. And I think one of the reasons why we haven't committed enough to our Indigenous students is a linguistic one. So I've always been very interested, obviously in Gwilym, but also in the Welsh example and commitment to the language and how it operates through higher degrees in particular. So I think the Welsh experience is a very useful one, I think, for understanding Indigenous languages in Australia. And obviously Aotearoa New Zealand with Maoritanga is a very good example as well. So I think we need to be learning from what you're doing, particularly in universities like Bangor. So thank you for that, because that will help me a lot. 
So next question is also, considering you have so much experience with supervisors, yes. <laughs> after that great experience, mm. diver diverse and breadth and number, yeah. sheer number, yeah. uh, what do you think is the characteristic of a, of a good supervisor? Oh, oh well, I should know about this. Should know well, you but really should. <laughs> well, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if I do. But for me, personally, I think it'd be a single supervisor, basically single, um, or a lead, a principal supervisor. Um, definitely hard deadlines, because if there's no hard deadlines, they're too soft, you don't produce work. Um, and weekly face-to-face -face supervision, Definitely, it's far better than giving a, a report or by you know bi weekly reports or exchanging emails. Um, I don't think it works as well as face to face interactions for me. So you want someone who has some leadership, who also you want the good quality feedback and you want the regular meetings. Yeah, um, I want someone to have a uh, student centres approach as well. You know, uh, uh, not to be didactic, have a degree of flexibility. Um, but yeah, and, and someone who's um, same goal um, or intended to get through the Bible and then for career trajectory as well. And again, it's interesting, we didn't talk about what you were going to say today, but mm. they're the characteristics of a successful student. So what you've just come across there, that is what the research literature shows, so absolutely mm -hmm. spot on. So I'm glad we have that checklist now, moving forward in your thesis, I'm not saying anything. Looking back on your experience of your PhD though, were there any warning signs that you would say now, all oh, that was a mistake, or that was a misstep, or that was an error? Yes, for me, as I acknowledged before, you know, I was I was ill, I wasn't yeah. honest with myself. Um, wow. and I fooled myself, if I was being honest, um, that I could do it. Um, and I could do it without kind of supervisory leads as well. And yeah, I think those are the early warning signs, but I wasn't delivering work, there were no hard deadlines, you were just left alone to do some literature review, we'll see you in a year perhaps, and show me what you've, you've done. It's a bit hippie really, isn't it? It was a bit, yeah, no planning, kind of. Yeah, uh, and and so in some ways it was you, you lack that self-care, I think that's really powerful too, for so many of the students out there, you keep pushing on. And maybe every now and again you should just stop and reflect on what you're doing and what you can do. Definitely. And also what you need from a supervisor. Yeah, and, and to make your needs um, quite clearly, um, express them quite clearly. Yeah. Uh, and tell them the drafts really into a, a frank discussion. Because you and I are laughing because clearly you know, these are the characteristics of like a more interpersonal relationship as well. Yes, I are guess you, so. Are you finding that it's like you've got to be honest at the start, and you've got to express self care and. You yeah. Know. I think I did at one point. Um, did have a, a, a kind of plan. I did have a yeah a weekly plan of, of what I wanted to do and, a, and a, an outline of what we would be doing, but it wasn't delivered or revised. Yeah, and what the literature shows, by the way, Gwilym Mate, is that you scaffold that. So if you have a, a goal that's too big, mm. it, it gets a bit overwhelming and you don't reach it. So if you're actually able to have that, that smaller goal that's the stepping stone, the scaffold, you'll get there which is what you're doing right now. Now, for all the students out there who are watching this vlog, and you're a wonderful human being, you're a brilliant human being, and also you've got a big heart, and I love you like life itself, you know that you're a really good mate of mine. What would you say to the students watching this to help them in their candidature? What have you learnt from your candidature? And obviously you're an academic, you're a great teacher yourself. What would you recommend to everyone watching this, mate? Work hard, say no to teaching, um, <laughs> well, you know, it's it, actually um, when it's the default position where you pr probably want money and, and feel the need to be accepted in an institution and teaching is exp a, a vital experience, but if you don't get your PhD, you're less likely to survive in an academic climate. Wow. I think that's huge advice, and I agree with you. Do some teaching, put it on the CV, but then stop. Earn a living, but don't do more than that. Well, hi. <laughs> um, thank you for everything you've done. You're a dear friend of mine. You're a wonderful human being. And you've enriched my life so much since I've met you. And it just seems really appropriate that we're here today in Bangor. Sort of like full circle, really. Yeah. You came and visited us in Adelaide. We come and visit you. And you're a very precious person. So thank you, thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. Isn't it fabulous? Yay. And everyone out there, I wish you love, light and peace 
from the truly beautiful University of Bangor. Did you get a wave? Yeah.